Welcome along to Al's Geek Lab. Hope you're well. Um, this is another one of those unscripted videos where I just go into something down that weird rabbit hole of stuff that I find on the interwebs, which I think is perhaps of interest to you if you're into retro computer things. But then again, if you weren't into retro computer things, why would you be watching this channel? Anyway, um, good day. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about something quite wonderful. Um, it's, it's, it's this. Um, Tra Tavis, sorry, not Travis. I almost said Travis there. No, Tavis or Mandy ports WordPerfect for Unix to Linux. So if you've ever um, used a computer in the 80s or 90s, the chances of you using WordPerfect or WordStar is pretty high. Now, um, this gentleman here, Tavis, has basically decided, he works for, this is what which I find really interesting, it's on the reg register here, you can read the whole article if you like, but um, he actually works for Google's Project Zero. Um, so this guy obviously is pretty clever, but he's got, he's got his own little pet projects that he likes to do. So today, what I'm going to do is download this. What he's done is he's tricked out the original Unix version of WordPerfect. What I'm going to do on the video today is do this uh, for myself, is download the deb package which he's made. The, so this is the easy way, this is kind of like the cheats way. And I'll see if I can get the deb package of WordPerfect for Unix, but he's recompiled it and made it all work in a modern day Linux environment. So if you don't know what WordPerfect is, then you can obviously, mm, I don't know, I don't know where you were, but you obviously weren't around for the, the 80s and 90s, but it's uh, it's a it was one of the better uh, word uh, word editors, I guess. Um, it was it was certainly the big big contest between it was like Word Perfect, Word Star, and then eventually Microsoft Word came along and got better iteratively, like Microsoft always does. And eventually, you know, the rest of this history, Microsoft Word won out, and I guess all the other ones just kind of disappeared into the into the background. Very similarly with uh, the spreadsheet world. We have Excel today, everybody knows Excel, but back in the 80s and 90s, it was most definitely Lotus 123. And in fact, before the WordPerfect port, uh, Tavis also did a very successful port of Lotus 123. So maybe I'll do another video on Lotus 123 as well. But you know, at the moment, what I'm thinking is I've got some scripts to write, some things to write, and then I've got machines in the background, like my old IBM XT, which has a perfectly reliable Telnet terminal on it now, thanks to the updates um, of Michael Brutman's Telnet, MC, MTCP Telnet, which um, if you haven't seen one of my more recent videos on it, um, there's a fork of it, which enables the full layout keyboard so that page up, page down keys, control, more control sequences and so forth. So using that with the old PC, uh, to use WordPerfect on a Linux box. That's my end goal here, right? So I wanna write some scripts. I wanna write them in my lovely old machine with the really clicky IBM Type M keyboard and just immerse myself in a DOS environment. Basically, I know it's slightly cheating. I'll be telnetted into my Raspberry Pi. But other than that, you know, it, it will look like I'm really running in a WordPerfect environment. And the good thing about that is then I can take that WordPerfect document from anywhere to anywhere, and as long as it's a standard Linux box. And then I can use modern things like LPR to print my documents and so forth. So I don't really have to do any more weird trickery, which at the moment I was using Word for MS-DOS. Oh yes, Word for MS-DOS, Word for DOS. Anyway, I was, I was doing that and then porting it across to Microsoft Word, um, which wasn't really working very well. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, my end goal is Get this installed on this Raspberry Pi that I've got down in the corner that you can't see. Get that um, installed on there. And then, uh, with any luck, I'll be able to then write some documents on that and have them to, you know, share them around with all my modern computing um, and do whatever I want to do with the documents. And I'll be using WordPerfect. Now, you would have thought that all of this talk about WordPerfect, that I would be, um, you know, golden with WordPerfect I've used every day. Well, no, I have personally never, ever used WordPerfect. But, you know, lots of people out there swear by WordPerfect. So this will be a, a baptism of fire as well. I used to use PFS first choice back in my DOS days. 
Um, and then, you know, eventually I went on to Windows and I was using Ami Pro before finally going on to Microsoft Word. So yeah, so it kind of, um, it looks like this. This is um, this is one uh, screenshot of um, WordPerfect 7 for Unix. Um, you can see here, and so it's got a sort of top menu. Original, the original versions of um, WordPerfect, and it says so in this article. So I mean, I'm not, I'm just paraphrasing from this article, but basically the original versions of WordPerfect were pretty archaic, apparently with keystrokes. So you wouldn't want to have run anything earlier than like version seven or version six because you had to use some funny, funny key sequences. Kind of like um, Wordus one two three as well. I think you had to use like backslash or slash or something to get into a menu system, and it was it was all kind of weird. So hopefully, uh, Word Perfect seven. In fact, here it is. Here up until Word Perfect five, not six. The program had very idiosyncratic user interface, which made heavy use of the function keys. Each key had a separate meaning on its own, or with Shift, Alt, or Control. With combinations of Shift and Alt and Control, it was complicated. No shit, Sherlock. And even experienced users often referred to a keyboard template. I don't know, do you remember those? They were actually like templates that you would, <laughs> they, they were physical cardboard things, and they would go over the keyboard. They would like sit on the keyboard. And because all keyboards were pretty much the same back in those days, you know, a lot of them were IBM type M's, in fact, they would literally just stick them on top of the keys of the keyboard because the function keys, if, that, if you do this, you know, it would help with your muscle memories. Eventually, you just keep looking down at the keyboard. Ah, oh, it's that key. So, uh, in fact, um, do we have a link there? Keyboard template. Here we go. We've got a link. What does this look like? Goodness, my internet's very slow. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what I remember. Yeah, so that would just sit at the top of your keyboard there with where all the functions are. And you can see, look, that's just um, scary. Uh, it looks to be in Dutch. Um, Vur Windows, but anyway, you know, you, you can see uh, there's a lot of functions per each function key. So yeah, nah, uh, as we'd say here in New Zealand, yeah, nah. Uh, um, I'm, I've definitely been in New Zealand too long if I'm saying things like yeah, nah. Um, now, so anyway, enough talk, let's get on with it. So you can download it from the GitHub website. And it says here, you can obviously, you can see that the source code is right there. Um, and obviously it's being updated um, even pretty recently. The, the readme file 15 days ago and then uh, the shell, uh, shell scripts that have been um, bug fixed uh, only 10 days ago. So this is obviously still in active development, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and that's there's a screenshot. Everybody needs screenshots. It's such a sort of a GIF, an animated GIF screenshot. You can see that there's mouse control and everything in there. Um, so it's showing how to bold text and how to print stuff off. Um, just wonderful, right? So you could. This is all running through the terminal, which is the the beautiful thing, right? I don't. You don't have to run this on um, in, a, in a graphical shell. It doesn't need to be. It can be literally on the console. I, oh, that's how I believe, anyway. So let's just let's have a look. At, so if you want an RPM or a dev package, you can go to the releases tab, or if you want to build it. Um, then you're going to need these things. So I'm going to see if we can actually use first of all the uh, the deb package, um, but I might not because uh, obviously the processor of the Raspberry Pi is an ARM processor, right? Whereas this um, may be a an Intel only D package. And these RPMs that it's downloading, uh, but they are uh, i386, so that's Intel x86 architecture. So I think the answer to downloading it and running it on a um, Raspberry Pi looks to be a very unfortunate neural. I don't think it's going to be possible, which is very sad. Oh. All right. So we're now in uh, Pop OS, which is a variant of Ubuntu, and I have gone to uh, the GitLab, GitHub page. Sorry, I will go over and make sure that all of these dependencies are are installed again. So I'll do an apt update. Here's a little pro tip for people who are 
like the Linux command line and uh, might not be aware of this. There's a, there's a thing which you can do to combine commands. So if you want to run one command after the other, you can do semicolon. So if you did want to do sudo apt update and then another command, you can do semicolon. So you could do sudo apt blah, blah, blah. But you can also do ampersand ampersand, which will do almost the same thing. It will run the next command, but only if the previous command completed successfully. So if the return code basically is a zero exit code. So you can have a non-zero exit code, one through 254, I think it is. And any of those codes basically mean that there's an error occurred and they'll have a different code depending on what type of error. So anyway, we'll do an at date, update, um, do it properly, and then an at install build dash essential. Why don't I just copy and paste these? The like lazy person. Yes, R. Patch elf and RPM to CPIO. Right, now it's doing its update. Okay, lots of packages to do there. No package BSD tar. So it does have a slash there, an alternative lib archive tools. So what I'll do is I'll just get rid of this first part because we don't need to do an update anymore. And I'll change that BSD tar to lib archive dash tools. I like that now. Yes, much better. Okay, it's going to install 85 megs, 85 whole megabytes of packages. Now, what I'm going to do, the final thing to do, I can just download the dev package. So I'll just tell you get that into there. Bish bosh bang. Excellent. Now, if I do sudo dpackage, which is the Debian package installer, and do wordperfect 8i386 deb, a what the treat. And then basically I just need to run WP to get started. Let's go, WP. Here we go. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! War perfect! <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay, um so the the fault look looks pretty basic, but you can you know make it look nice and like this. So um yeah, I'll uh, I'll have a look at making it nicer looking. You can see here as well, there's built-in spelling and grammar checking tools. Oh, wow. Also says there was a binding there. Uh, escape plus uh, that to get you. So there's escape equals to get you to the top menu, which is a really weird binding. Not sure I'm going to be ready for that. Escape equals, right, okay. Able boxes and all sorts. Line art, wow. It's pretty sophisticated for... Um, or something of this ilk, I think. Press exit when done. Press exit when done. How? What is exit? You can change fonts, all this sort of stuff. So obviously, whilst you're still editing in a text mode editor, um, it's obviously got support for graphics. So if you are opening it up in a you know a graphic version of Word, um, Word Perfect, you'd be able to see all the graphics. And obviously, if you print it off. All those graphics would appear so still quite cool that you've actually got the ability to um do all of that there's built-in help as well probably will need that that looks quite usable so there's um cut copy and paste I'll, I'll let's have a look at how cut copy and paste works okay so hello there my name is bobbin yeah, that margin is... Oh, I'm still in graphics mode. How do I exit out of this box? Press exit when done. How does one exit from graphics mode? I, no. No, I don't want to help. Note to self, first thing to do, don't go into graphics mode.
Okay, here I am in World Perfect again. Okay, now I'm going to see how one um, navigates about. So, home key. Um, it was quite odd there. So, pressing the home key on its own does nothing. Pressing home, there we go, nothing. But if I press left arrow, now it goes home. Go figure. Right, so I want to uh, copy and paste. So. Edit, copy, no, how do I copy? Block, ah, block. Back in those days, first of all, you had to obviously select the text area that you wanted, right? So if I do block, ah, right. So if I want just this bit, hello, my name is Bob and Threadbear. Now if I go back to the menu, go to edit, and go to copy, and then go down here. Oh, put it in automatically, that's weird. Eesh. Some learning, I think. It's not. It's not. Not quite as intuitive uh, as as Word. I've got to be honest. But I think it will take some. It take a brief period of learning. I don't think it's something which is sort of insurmountable. But um, definitely get a feeling that you could you could get used to it fairly quickly. Um, but but it's not as uh, logical for me. Um, as as just Microsoft Word is, because the Microsoft Word um, experience is a lot more straightforward. So there's two things for me. Um, it can't be a daily driver because it won't run on the on the ARM-based processor, and uh, obviously it takes a little bit of getting used to uh, in order to get to get to feelings to get to grips with. So um, not not horrendous but uh, my little first overview of a word perfect for uh, for Unix and getting it to work obviously on um, on a, a modern day Linux box so you can see this is a bang up to date uh, version of pop OS which is derived from Ubuntu which is derived from Debian okay thank you very much for watching the video today if uh, you'd like to help me make some more videos then please head over to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab, and you can join one of these people coming down your screen right now um, in supporting the channel. It helps in many different ways. I put 100% of the funds that I get from my donators on Patreon and YouTube members right back into the channel. So that I've paid for things like cameras, it pays for my Adobe Premiere license. It, it pays for the general upkeep of the channel. So all of the money that I earn from the, your donations goes straight back into making quality content. Um, not all of them are as quick and dirty as this particular video, but sometimes quick and dirty is just what you need, right? So anyway, thanks very much for watching Al's Geek Lab. I'll be back again with yet another video. Until then, see you soon.